Now it's time for some drama here on 4 Extra, which was first broadcast in 1989. Intent to Deceive is centred on the facts around the death of Eva Wilderspin, killed by a hit-and-run driver. But the question is, why is her brother Gregory under suspicion? Look, the bank manager was polite, but tough. Unless he sees proof of a considerable upturn in my finances, he's going to call in the mortgage and the loan. What does that mean, exactly? Well, it means I have to sell the house. By the time the bank's taken its dues, I'll be left with only about 6,000 to start all over again. Oh, Greg, you were always a muddler. You yes, and you were always the lucky one. You've got a very generous annuity. Generous? I'll cover the mortgage and overdraft repayments and the life insurance premiums. Then, for heaven's sake, sell that rambling place of yours. And rent rooms until you've got yourself out of this mess. I don't know how you manage to work at all with these perpetual money worries. All I need is something to tide me over. For three months, that's all. Then I'm pretty sure I'll get another commission from Henry Pym. Wouldn't you do better going back to teaching? Then at least you'd have a regular income. Okay, let's not open that can of beans either, please. All right, all right. Something to tide you over. How much? Twelve thousand. Intense to Deceive by Michael Robson with Nigel Anthony, Zila Clark and Steve Hodson. Accident. Oh, my... G oh, God. Y yes, 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 of course. You have my consent. You're, you're the people who know what's required. Yes. Yes, I'll come at once. Mr. Wilderson. Yes? Detective Chief Inspector Turnbull, sir. Detective? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was simply told there'd been an accident. What, what happened? A call was made to the local station at five past two this morning. The caller, a man who wouldn't give his name, said there was a badly injured woman lying by the side of the lane, close to Belgrove Crossroads. What hit and run? On the face of it. Has my sister been able to describe what happened? She was unconscious when she was found, and she's been unconscious ever since. Then how did you manage to discover that I'm the next of kin? The lady's identity and address were obtained from the contents of her handbag, sir. I then went to her home and looked for her personal address book. The only will to spin in it was you. I got my number was in there. I'm her only relative. I'm afraid we need you to identify her at once, sir. And the medical people will require you to sign the appropriate forms of authority for the surgery they've had to carry out on your verbal agreement only. There were a few minor facial lacerations, Mr. Wilderspin, but fortunately her head wasn't struck by the vehicle. The cuts appear to have been caused when your sister was thrown into the ditch by the side of the lane. Her features aren't disfigured. But it can't be possible. <laughs> Doctor, this lady is not my sister. Of course, the uh, lady's hair was hidden by the medical cap. Well, that could make quite a difference. Look, she's not my sister. What colour's your sister's hair? Dark brown, like mine. So is that lady. Look, Inspector, I can see the whole of her face from her forehead to her chin, and I can assure you she is not my sister. Hmm. When did you last see your Miss Wilderspin? About six years ago. Six years? When you're only 80-odd miles apart? Yes, well, we had a serious disagreement before she left London to live here. We haven't been in touch since. I see. But people don't change radically in six years. That that, that person looks quite like my sister, but they're the same thing. I mean, I mean, people say I look quite like Ronald Coleman. But Who's I mean... Ronald Coleman, sir? Oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I can see you don't believe a word I've said. <laughs> I simply don't understand how your statement squares with the fact that the handbag she was carrying at the time of the incident contained items personal to Miss 
Eva Wilderspin. Oh, perhaps it was stolen. I mean, that's, that's something you're going to have to discover, isn't it? Look, my sister's lived in Compton Heritage for six years. Plenty of people in the village must know her. Find them. Get them over here. Let them see her. I'm, I'm as concerned about the condition of that poor woman in there as you are, but I'm more concerned about my sister. Where is she? All right, Frank, you've read the report. What do you think? Well, <sighs> it all starts with that call, sir, doesn't it? The fellow who rang emergency to report finding the woman. The fellow who wasn't there when our people arrived. So? Well, it seems to me we can probably have seen one of two things. First, the caller hit the woman with his car by accident, night and rain, panicked and drove on. Then he pulled himself together and at least made that call from the kiosk and hoped the ambulance would get her to the hospital before it was too late. Mm. And the second? Well, the caller wasn't involved with the incident at all. Just a guy with a skin full of booze on his way home. Sees the woman lying there, takes a closer look, then beetles off to the nearest public telephone, makes the call. Then, because he's way over the legal limit, gets off home fast. Mm. And what about the brother? What's he up to? Ah, really weird, that is. I mean, why would he invent a situation like that when he knows if the woman survives, she can tell us the facts? Hmm. Let's look at it charitably, for the moment. Or could it be this? He's feeling guilty that he hasn't been in touch with her for six years. And when he knows she's critically injured, mightn't pull through, before they have a chance to make up this quarrel of theirs... He tries to fool himself. It's not his sister at all. Well, he was shattered, wasn't he? Mm. Or he's the best actor I've ever seen. But he's obviously an intelligent man. I reckon when he's had time to calm down and think things out, he'll agree she is his sister. Yeah. Well, for her sake, for, for all our sakes, I hope to God she survives. Yes. Yes, Newton, what is it? A uh, farmer in Mulbrook's reported a Land Rover abandoned in a narrow track leading to one of his pastures, sir. Can't get his cattle past. Have you got all the details? Yes, sir. We've traced ownership to a Mr. Arthur Graham of <laughs> Mainden Cottage, Busey. <laughs> Graham. Graham. Oh. Do you know him, sir? Oh, yes. You know him well, don't we, Frank? <laughs> right, young tear away. Hey, Frank, you get over to Graham's place now and lean on him. If he tries his jack, then I'd act. Bring him in. I'll take it. Yes? Yeah, all right, put it on. Good morning, ma'am. I see. I'll be over right away. <sighs> the victim, whoever she was, died ten minutes ago. Uh, without having recovered consciousness at any time. Oh. Frank, before you talk to Graham, send Frost and Davril around the whole of Compton Heritage. They've got to find at least three responsible people who knew Miss Wilderspin well. Uh, Neighbours, domestic help, shopkeepers, the vicar. We have got to have positive identification for the coroner. Mr. Wilderspin. Yes? I'm sorry about the news, sir. Well, so am I. But she wasn't my sister. Yes. Naturally, sir, I am taking what you say very seriously. And for that reason, I'd like you to come with me to your sister's home. There's a chance we may find something that'll be helpful to both of us there. I know my sister's home very well. But you told me you hadn't seen her since she moved here, sir. Yes, but she inherited my parents' house. and I, I spent the first 18 years of my life there. Hello then, Arthur. Oh, it's you. Come about my motor, have you? What's the story there? Have you found him? Ah, Somehow you lost your motor, did you? Damn sure I lost him. Went to the yard this morning, he weren't there. I rang into the station right quick. Now, where's he to? Oh, you rang in. That's good. <laughs> you mean good? Some bugger stole my motor and I had to walk to work. What happened last night? What happened? Someone stole my motor. What were you doing last night? Where are my two most nights? Stapled in arms. How'd you get there? Guy Lambert and Toby Scase picked me up and bring me home. How long were you at the pub? Don't know exactly. The same finding my motor, is there? How long? Got there about eight. Left at finishing time. Why? Finishing time? 10.40? Oh, on the nail, Sergeant. And Lambert drove you home? Yes. Arsed him. 
When you got home, was your Land Rover in the yard? How the hell would I know? Went straight to bed, didn't I? Wonderful views from here. Yes. It was always my favourite room. What will happen to the house? Supposing it was your sister who died. My parents believed in primogenitor, Inspector. Of a particular sort. They'd leave the house and grounds in their entirety to their first child, whatever its sex. So when they died, Eva inherited the place. If she had children, it would be entailed to her first child. If she died childless and I survived, it would come to me. Mm. But she's not dead. Anyway, that woman in the hospital isn't her, so... Lord knows what'll happen. Mind if I smoke, sir? Oh, go ahead. A pipe? Feel free. Thank you, sir. It's not everyone who's prepared to put up with pipe smoke. My daughter gives me hell. Really? You'd recognise your sister's handwriting. Oh, naturally. After a gap of six years. <laughs> Inspector, uh, when she was about 15, Eva decided to learn and use Chancery script. It was all the vogue then. Special nibs, black ink, white paper. She's used it ever since. I see. Because this is her address book. Yes? Is that her handwriting? It, it could be. Aren't you certain? Well, the, the whole point about Chancery script is that anyone can write it, if they have the patience to learn the technique, and, and, and everyone's hand looks much the same. Mm. I found no address or telephone number for a doctor, but there is one for a dentist in Fawnsett St. Nicholas. So? Now, if your sister was a patient of his, he'd have complete dental records, sir which we can compare with the teeth of the lady who died this morning. If they tally, will you accept that it was your sister who died? Not a lot to report, sir, and most of it negative. Hmm. Her movement yesterday. Well, the cleaning lady was there all morning, and Miss Wilderspin didn't leave the place during that time. Yeah. Did she have any visitors, morning or afternoon? From the time when Mrs. Benison, cleaning lady, mm. left the house at about half twelve until about eight in the evening, when Miss Wilderspin arrived at the Lamb and Flag, the record's blank. Mm. So she went to the pub. Was this a, a one-off visit, or, or was she a regular? Well, apparently she went there for dinner on Wednesday and Saturday evenings. Last night she had a couple of drinks at the bar, chatted to a few customers, then went to the dining area for a meal. On her own? Yes, sir. She was usually on her own, but sometimes there were a few people with her. Mostly Londoners, the landlord thinks. Any one person in particular? Not that the landlord or the barmaid recollected, sir, no. Yeah. What did they say when you asked if her brother was ever with her? Well, they didn't remember that she ever mentioned a brother. Oh. Well, all I want to know is this. Was he telling the truth about never visiting Eva here? And damn it all, it had been his childhood home... All right, Frank, go on. Eva went to the dining area for her meal, on her own. She had half a bottle of wine with her supper and read a book throughout the meal. A book? No book was found anywhere near the scene of the incident. No, sir. They used to keep it under the counter for her. They showed me it. Ah. Huge, great biography. So she'd just read it at the pub and on her own. <sighs> Did anyone go over and, and uh, talk to her at any time during her supper? Well, the staff don't think so, sir. So what time did she leave the pub? Just before closing time, around 10.30. Mm. Did she usually walk to and from the pub? Yes, sir. It's less than half a mile from there to her house, and unless it was foul weather, she was inclined to walk. So anyone could have discovered her pattern of behaviour? Looks like that, sir. Mm. So it wasn't raining when she left. I, otherwise, she'd have bummed a lift home from one of the regulars. That's right. Must have started raining when she was oh, roughly halfway home, not mm -hmm. long before she was hit. You got a list of the names of all the people in the pub last night? Everyone the landlord and the barmaid recognised, sir. Mm. Any strangers? Uh, Middle-aged couple, sir. Quiet, friendly. Geordies, they sounded like, landlord thought. And what time did they leave? About eight, after a bar snack. No. 
Well, tomorrow we'll talk to the regulars. Well, what did they make of her, the, the, the staff of the pub? Well, it seems that those who knew her liked her well enough, but no one knew her well. Any talk of a regular man in her life? Yeah, no talk from that quarter, sir. Oh, oh I had your message about the Land Rover. Came out a bit garbled. <laughs> Sorry about that, Duke. Yeah. Well, Arthur Graham was driven to and from the Stapleton Arms by Lambert and Scase. Pleasant enough, lads, no form. Yeah. They left the pub at kicking out time and drove Arthur straight home, in the opposite direction to the one taken by Miss Wilderspin. They saw him into the house, and according to his girlfriend, he was so smashed that he fell asleep without taking his shoes off. Yeah. This girl, is she reliable? Yeah, too reliable for the likes of Arthur. So when did he last use the Land Rover? Yesterday afternoon, sir. Delivered a load of split logs to Enderby Farm and got home about six. And left the keys in the ignition? Oh, he says not. Yeah. But he couldn't find them this morning. And he's never had a spare set since he bought the vehicle. So he could be joyriders? Could be, sir. Boring. But we've got to get them, and get them fast. A woman's dead. And I want the driver responsible inside a Crown Court as quick as you like. Henry Pym. Henry, it, it's Gregory Wilderspin. Greg, how are you, my old love? How's every little thing? And how's the music? Yeah, things are terrible. I, I'm speaking from Eva's house. The police say she was killed in a hit-and-run accident. Eva? Yes, but I, I, I know the dead woman is not Eva. Hang up, bad Greg. Is that, is that <laughs> if I didn't ever know my own sister. What do you mean? <sighs> Look, Henry, this, this, this whole thing's played havoc with my work schedule, and, and the score isn't finished. Tomorrow there's the inquest on, on, on this dead lady, and I've got to be there. And I'll tell the court the truth. Then the press are going to be after me, so I need a bolt hole. I need to finish the score in private, so can I use the studio? The court is very aware of your distress and your anxiety, Mr. Wilderspin. But you've heard all the corroborative evidence from the village postmistress, from the rector from the landlord of the local inn, all of whom saw your sister, if not daily, then at least once or twice a week, for six years. They saw the unfortunate victim of this appalling incident and independently identified her as Miss Eva Wilderspin of Challoners Grange. Dental records confirmed this. Do you still persist in maintaining that the dead woman was not your sister? I don't doubt that the woman who was killed had lived in this village for six years as my sister, looking quite like her, and using a good enough reproduction of her handwriting. What I am maintaining is that this woman must have assumed my sister's identity before she ever came to live here, for, for reasons I can't begin to understand. Now, come in. Oh. Hello, Mr. Wilderspin. My name's Kim Fairless. I was in Cork today. Oh, yeah? I'm a reporter from the Western Chronicle. May I talk to you? Well, I'm leaving in ten minutes. Oh, that'll do. Oh, you better come in. I've looked for earlier photographs of her here. None. And I know there aren't any at my home. I've never kept any letters or postcards from her. Why would I? How long did she live in London before she moved out here? Oh, about four years, I suppose. Have you still got her old address? Address? Oh, she had several. Chelsea, Pimlico, Marylebone. No, I haven't. She was eight years older than I am, and we had nothing in common beyond our parentage. Our last meeting ended in an unholy row, and well, we severed communications completely. So you and she never met again, or spoke on the telephone? No, not a word, not a line in six years. Mm. But you don't forget what your own sister looks like, for God's sake. Would you? But why would another woman want to assume your sister's identity? Well, my notion, and, and I admit it, it, it sounds like the plot of a B-movie, is, is this. The woman met Eva, probably at some party in London. Perhaps someone remarked they would look alike. This woman cultivated Eva, got to know her lifestyle. She's in some deep trouble, wants to disappear. So when she knows Eva's inherited this place and an increased annuity, and that Eva and I are never likely to meet again, she disposes of Eva. Starts a new life, and the new identity here as Eva Wilderspin. 
Well, it sounds lame, it sounds absurd. What, what other explanation could there be? But this was your parents' house, and you and Eva once lived here. I was surely someone in the village would spot the difference. No, my sister went her own way from home when she was 18 or 19. Apart from a very occasional visit, she'd never spent any time here or in the village. You're just leaving. Where can I reach you if I find anything useful? No, I'd rather get in touch with you. Look, no offence, but... I'm wildly behind on some work, and uh, I promised my paymaster I'd get stuck into it immediately after the inquest. What kind of work? Uh, I'm a hack composer. I write library music. What on earth is that? <laughs> well, if radio, uh, television, film companies can't afford to commission original music, and they don't want to pay for copyright music, they, they lift a disc from the shelf-marked library, find the sound they like, and use that, and they pay far less for it. Uh, I suppose it's like turning out pulp paperbacks when you'd rather be working on the great English novel. <laughs> you may not get any public recognition, but if you work hard enough, you can get by. I've got two tracks to write by yesterday. Look, I must go. Thanks for your interest. I'll be in touch when the album's complete. You promise? I promise. You're the first person who hasn't thought I'm completely crazy. And if there is a scoop, it'll be yours exclusively. It seems a lousy thing to say, but those last two tracks you wrote, after the, uh, after the problems, they're probably the best things you've ever done. Tremendous nervous energy. Yes, well, I had plenty of frustrations to work off. Why didn't you ask me to identify the, the woman? Hell, Eva and I were lovers for almost two years. I'd have known the real from the substitute. Well, I was very tempted to ball for your help. But I decided not to on two counts. The first, it was selfish. You go to a mortuary and you expect to see Eva because that's who they all say she is. You get a glimpse of a dead face, which did look like Eva, and you say, yes, it is Eva. Where does that put me? The second reason was, I hope, unselfish. Toward the end, Eva gave you a bad time. Well, you got over that. You made a good marriage, you have children, and you're going places. With what you've done for charity, you deserve the biggest public honour they can give you, and it must be given. Oh, come no, 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 on, Henry, Graham. Henry, it's true. And if you'd attended that coroner's inquest, the old days and the tough times would have come out. Your big news. Well, I appreciate your thoughtfulness, Greg. And don't think it'll be forgotten. Now, there's just a chance I can persuade Stuart Otway to consider you for the new ITV series. Here's... I need to discuss your sister's finances, sir. Oh, I see. Well, you better sit down. Yeah, those seats are dry, I think. Thank you. Oh, thanks. I'll be more specific, sir. Please tell me all you know or remember of Miss Wilderspin's general financial state. Earnings, pensions, legacies. Well, she inherited the family house. Uh -huh. uh, and she and I both received annuities of 12,000. When we were still on speaking terms, Eva told me that... She was a textile coordinating consultant to a number of firms. So that must have brought her in some kind of competence. What sort of competence would you guess? Sort of, I really don't know. I didn't think about textiles. But your guess? Oh, perhaps 10,000 a year in those days. Eva seemed to spend more of her time enjoying herself than in working. Hmm. What level would you say her standard of living was? Oh, elegant. She travelled widely. Dressed very well, wined and dined high on the hog, bought some good furniture, decent paintings. Morning, Greg. Oh, morning, um, Lucy. Uh, so that with her fees and the annuity, her income might be about mm, 22,000 a year? Hmm. And after income tax, personal and state insurances, that would leave her about 14,000 a year? And if she lived well, with that large house and grounds to maintain, she'd have very little left to put by for a rainy day, wouldn't she? Well, very little. We but run her bank account to Earth. Bristol. Bristol. And we discovered your sister had put by just over £300,000 for the rainy day. Well, that's impossible. Well, would the bank give me false information, sir? Well, no, no, no I, I suppose not. But 
Well, why did you need it in the first place? Who gave you the right to have access to, to Eva's bank account? Well, you should be rounding up the, the joyriders who killed that woman. Forensic evidence has established that it was a local man's Land Rover that struck your sister and led to her death. We have established, to our satisfaction, that the owner of the vehicle wasn't driving it at the time. And we're inclining to the belief that the whole affair was pre-planned. And I find that theory as far-fetched as you find my certainty that the woman wasn't my sister. A woman is dead, killed violently. Who she was, we'll leave aside for the moment. The court satisfied she was Eva Wilderspin, and so am I. But what concerns me is less who she was than what she was that someone had to kill her. For why murder? Thousands more people are killed on the roads in accidents than are, than are murdered by any means. It's a question of patterns of activity, sir. We aren't ignoring the possibility that some new one-off joyrider suddenly did his thing and killed your sister by accident, but it's on a back burner. Well, then, all right, but I, I, I keep asking, why, why murder? There was a case a few months ago in London, sir. Someone wanted the wife of a Middle Eastern diplomat killed, and so a tearaway was hired. He stole a car and went at that woman, on the pavement, in a crowded street. The woman was badly injured, but the tearaway wasn't caught. Yes, 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 I remember that incident, but it was held by the police to have a political motive behind it. You're going to tell me that there's... No, a Special Branch has no file on Eva Wilderson. Oh, how are you surprised? So, we come to the most familiar motives for murder. Sex and money. Usually with a domestic background. Take sex first. Husband, wife and third party. Your sister wasn't married. So, was there a lover... And a third part. Well, why are you asking me? I've no idea what kind of love life my sister never had. We're asking everyone, sir. Everyone. Then money. Is the victim wealthy, heavily insured? Either way, who's the beneficiary should that person die? I don't know. My sister and I have been estranged for almost seven years. How, how can I know what legal disposition she may have made? If she did make a will, and logic with a solicitor, then we'll find it. It may take time, but we'll find I it. I hope you damn well do. But in the meantime, sir, we do have to ask around. Supposing your sister died without making a will, who would eventually benefit from her estate? Well, clearly the next of kin, me. So, sir, we're striking people off the books one by one. For your sake, as well as ours. Will you tell us what you were doing on the day and night of August the 15th, the night Eva Wilderspin was killed? She was not Eva Wilderspin. Yeah. Look, I'll, I'll have to, to find my diary. Thank you. Mm. Nice place he's got here. Yes. More than you or I could ever afford. Mm. Wonder how he'll react to your interesting little news item. <laughs> he'll box clever. Well, uh, there's nothing at all down for August the 15th. See this out. Thank you. But you can remember how you spent the day. Uh, yes, I was working uh, here all day and most of the evening, but um, I was in bed and asleep when your people telephoned me. You didn't go out at all? Well, I suppose I may have walked down the lane to post a letter, but I really can't remember. Well, then the evening, did anyone call to see you? Mm, no, 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 I'm certain no one did. You go out for an evening meal? No, uh, I just didn't feel like being companionable in a pub, so I had a fire up here and went to bed quite early. Listened to the radio for a while and then slept till the call came. Yeah. Did, did you make or receive any telephone calls that evening? Well, how am I supposed to remember? Um, well, I, I, I was in the studio working on a score. Uh, came through the kitchen to make some coffee. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I do remember. While I was waiting for the kettle to boil, I made two calls. One to my godson to congratulate him on some um, cricketing achievement. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the other to a friend in London. About what time did you make them? Oh, uh, probably nine-ish. I can't be more accurate than that. But if you kindly let us have those numbers and we telephone your friends, it's just possible that they may just have some reason for remembering the times more precisely. What do you want to know? There's just one more date I'd like you to check in your diaries. Sir. Which? The 5th of August, ten days before the incident. Mm. The 5th? Hmm? There's nothing at all, see? Nothing. When someone plans to see you here... Perhaps for a meeting or a meal. Do you tend to make a note of it in your diary? Well, I suppose so, yes. You'd note down, uh, Tom, for dinner, Harry, here, 10.30. Mm, something like that. But Miss Wilderspin had certain regular habits. Wednesday and Saturday evenings, she'd have supper at her local pub. If there was no one there she wanted to talk to for any length of time, she'd read a book. 
Oh, what's so remarkable about that? His sister was reading a very weighty volume. I mean, a, a big, heavy book. Not the contents, you understand, just the physical nature of the thing. A biography of Henry James. Oh, you don't surprise me at all. Henry James is one of Eva's favourite authors. Oh, really? So you admit now that the woman was your sister? No, it, it is an extraordinary coincidence, though. Extraordinary. When we made a search of your sister's house, we were rather surprised to find no diary of any kind. After all, your sister appears to have been a, a well-travelled and busy woman with her textile consultancy. So why no diary to ensure she kept her appointments? Well, I really have no idea. Yesterday we were in the Lamb and Flag again, and the landlord asked us what he should do with the biography that your sister invariably left there. I felt it had better be temporarily, at least, in our keeping. In it, when I opened it up, there was a very tall, very slim engagement book. Page a month, you know the time. Yes, well... Lots of entries in your sister's chancery script, and a single entry for the 5th of August, ten days before her death. A day on which your diary is free of engagements, but a day which your sister had noted. Greg, 2.30. Kim Fairless. Kim, Gregory Wilderspin. Lousy. I've just had an extremely unpleasant visit from Chief Inspector Turnbull and Man Friday. Look, I, I, I need to talk to you, Kim. Are you free this evening? This evening? Yes. Yeah. I have to be in the Wansdyke area. That's about halfway between us. Shall we meet at the Queen's Arms in Wansdyke around nine? Queen's Arms, Wansdyke. I'll be there. Uh, and thank you. So your friends confirmed that you had spoken to them last Thursday evening? Oh. Yes. And even better, Johnny Hopkins remembered that he had to ring me back because the line at my end was so bad. Which proves you were at home, yeah. that you couldn't have made the calls from a public telephone in or near Compton Heritage. Yes, but the trouble is, Johnny thinks we talked sometime around half eight because I, I rang just as his favourite telly show was finishing. And I thought we'd spoken well sometime between nine and nine thirty. But does that matter? You were at home. Oh. Sure, but if I'd left the house shortly after the calls to and from Johnny, say at, what, 20 to 9, I could, if I'd driven fast on a route I knew well, have been in Compton Heritage by 10 o'clock. Plenty of time to pick up this fellow's Land Rover, drive with that woman when she was walking home around 10.45, then ditch the Land Rover and be back at my place not long after midnight. But the police don't seriously believe... Oh, Kim, look, it's, they're trying to frighten the life out of me. They're succeeding. They're the two most sinister people I've ever met. The moment I told Turnbull that uh, the woman in question wasn't my sister, he went very cold on me. Well, why should you lie about something as important as that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know I look, look at it from Turnbull's point of view. Suppose I somehow knew how much the woman called Eva Wilderspin had in her account, and because of our quarrel, I reckon she'd never leave it to me if she ever came to make a will. Then I'd have a strong financial motive for killing her, wouldn't I? I mean, who else stands to gain? But he... If she wasn't your sister, yeah. there could be all kinds of people she knew or was even related to who might inherit when she died. Well, exactly the point I've tried to make to Turnbull. He tells me he's still following up that theory, but I can sense by his behaviour that he's doing nothing of the sort. I want to help, of course, but how? Oh, Turnbull caught me with both barrels today. First, he sprang it on me that the book the woman was currently reading was a new biography of Henry James. And without thinking, I said, well, I was nothing strange about that. Henry James is one of Eva's favourite authors. But what's wrong... Oh, my God, yes. Oh, yes, I see. Yeah. You're thinking, how would an imposter know what Eva's favourite reading was? And why would she bother to carry on this, this, this subterfuge after so long? So there I was, already caught with my fingers in the till, and then Turnbull came up with the right barrel. He said he turned up an engagement diary used by, by that woman, and the only entry for the 5th of August mm -hmm. read Greg, 2.30. <laughs> Well, say it. If she was an imposter, why would she arrange to meet you, the yeah. only person who could see through her impersonation? Yeah, why? Now can you see why I'm terrified? Particularly because I have, so far as I know, no witnesses to my movements on the 5th of August, the day of this alleged meeting. This is all getting very nasty. Nasty? Unless... What? Unless Turnbull was trying it on. That engagement for the 5th with you, trying it on to see how you'd react. Yes, well, that occurred to me later. It also occurred to me that if he was prepared to throw a curve like that, it means he's looking nowhere else. My time is limited. So what can I do? If you believe in me, you'll have to convince your editor 
that you have to take up the chase on my behalf. So, first off, I'm going to London tomorrow to hire a private inquiry agent. There's something I always ask a prospective client. Why me? Why choose a female investigator? Yeah, well, well, because uh, the inquiry concerns uh, two females, Mrs. Sinclair. Uh, my sister and the woman who for six years passed herself off as my sister. Well, since what you want done doesn't involve any infringement of the law, Mr. Wilderspin, it doesn't matter a damn whether I believe your claim or not. So long as your money's on the level, I'll put in the work. <laughs> Well, at least you believe in plain dealing. One satisfied client may well lead to another by word of mouth. That's how one builds up a clientele. Look, if you can pull this one off, you'll have more publicity than you've ever dreamed of. Anyway, um, here's a list of the districts, as far as I can remember. The streets in which my sister lived between hmm. roughly 1976 and 1980. Uh, now, she, had, uh, she has good health and excellent teeth. She'd certainly have found a dentist she trusted and have gone there regularly while she was living in London. All we need to find is the dentist she used. And if he still has her records, we're home and dry. The law stipulates that dental records have to be kept for a minimum of five years, Mr. Wilderson. But there's no preferred maximum. It's quite possible that any records that may have been established for your sister when she's in London will have been destroyed by now. Yeah, well, it's a chance I'm prepared to take. It's your money, and it's your choice. Now... Where and how shall I contact you? Good. Good. Well, now, uh, do sit down, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Collins. We <coughs> have the lady's will, of course, and it's been photocopied. Quite simple, really. Very short, no complications, no codicils. There you are. Thank you. Dated March the 18th, 1979. Uh-huh. Mm, yeah, much as I thought it would be. Mr. Collins... This is a blow-up of a passport photograph of Miss Wilderspin taken in 1971. Thank you. Is that a true likeness of the Miss Eva Wilderspin, the author of this one? I'm afraid I simply can't tell you, Sergeant. There were only two brief meetings several years ago. Uh, yes, of course, sir. See this signature, correct? Mm. Chancery script. Mm. Very yeah. clear, but impersonal, I always think. Yes, sir. No stamp of the writer, only of the style. At any rate, I hope you'll be able to help me. Presumably, when the unfortunate Miss Wilderspin died, her next of kin was informed. Yes. But I have to tell you, sir, that we're treating this affair as a case of murder. Oh. Uh, for that reason, I must ask you to hold off notifying Mr. Wilderspin of your possession of his sister's will until Monday. I need that leeway, Mr. Collins. I need it badly. Well, it's Friday afternoon now, and there are more immediate matters to attend to. Yes, well, Chief Inspector, I'll hold off until first post Monday morning, but no later. Very cooperative of you, sir. Well, we're both practitioners of the law. <laughs> Quite so, sir. And I'll hang on to this photocopy of the will, if I may. Uh, yes, in the circumstances, of course you may. Oh, things are looking up, Frank. In a week, we should have a case strong enough to present to the DPP. Oh, good. I'm due for leave at the end of the month, and it's going to cost me if I have to cancel the package holiday. My wife won't be best pleased, either. Mm -hmm. uh, we can move things forward today. Look, Eva Wilderspin made her will when she was living at flat 317 Vincent Row. Mm -hmm. One of the witnesses lived at flat 1. You go and see her. Find out all you can about Eva. Associates, boyfriends, visitors. I'll tackle the second witness, uh, Faith Dunnett, personnel manager. I didn't know Eva for long, Chief Inspector. Oh, a couple of years, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But we were quite friendly. She contributed several articles on a freelance basis to one of our magazines. Ah. And, and was she well-liked? Oh, yes, I think so. Very intelligent, articulate. Uh, nice sense of humour. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen her for years, but it's, it's still a shock to know she's dead. Yes, of course. Did you ever meet her brother? Gregory, yes, a ah. few times. <laughs> and how did they get on, he and Eva? Oh, well, pretty well, I think. They weren't demonstrative, you know, but they were obviously fond of each other. Uh, did she have a, a circle of friends in town? Well, in a sense, yes. <laughs> in a sense, how do you mean, Miss Dunnett? She was extremely friendly with Henry Pym. She mixed a lot with his um, set. Henry Pym, should I know the name? Well, there's absolutely no reason why you should. He's one of the biggest producers and managers of pop music today. Oh. 
He's been making a name for himself for uh, charitable work, too. Ah, no, no, name still doesn't ring a bell. However, what was the relationship between Miss Wilderspin and Mr... Uh, Pym. Oh, Pym. They were lovers, and known to be lovers. This was before Henry married, of course. Uh -huh. Pym, wealthy and successful. Eva, attractive, capable, both single, and lovers. Why did they split up? I've no idea. Whenever I saw them together, they were the picture of happiness. And yet, late in 1979, Eva quit London and buried herself in the heart of rural Dorset. Do you have any idea why? Well, one can guess, of course. We all guessed. For one reason or another, known only to themselves, they, they fell out of love. It happens, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Would you know if they saw anything of each other after Eva's move to the country? Oh, I wouldn't have thought so. No. A few months after Eva had left the scene, Henry met and married his present wife. Yeah, she would hardly be likely to encourage visits to or from an old flame of Mr. Pym, would she? <laughs> oh, what about you, Miss Dunnett? Have you ever visited Eva in Compton Heritage? No, no. First I knew she was there with a change of address card. Ah. And I think I told you we weren't best friends, just London acquaintances. Yes. Well, you've been very helpful, and I'm grateful, Miss Dunnett. Would you take a look at this photograph? Yes. Is it Eva? I'd like your comment on that, Mum. Well, I suppose it could be Eva, or why are you showing it to me? <laughs> why are you showing it to me? To ensure we've been talking about the same lady. Is there any doubt? Uh, oh. Well, she looks quite young here. Hairstyle's different, set of the mouth. Is this a passport photograph? A blow-up of the original, taken mm. in 1971. That accounts for it, then. Passport photographs never look like the original. <laughs> no. But it is the Eva Wilderspin you knew. I couldn't and wouldn't swear to it in a court of law, Chief Inspector. Cheers, sir. Cheers, Frank. Oh, I needed this. How long have you been here? Well, about half an hour. Trip to Vincent Rose a dead loss. Oh, you can't win them all. Have a crisp. Yeah. Mrs. Pallister, the one who co-witnessed Eva's will. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, she died in 1980. Oh. No one else at 17 Vincent Row or the houses close by had ever heard of Eva Wilderspin, let alone knew her. Oh, not to worry. I got a few useful pointers from Faith Dunnett. And we have a copy of the will. Naturally, I'll do everything I can to help you, Chief Inspector. And when a former girlfriend dies in circumstances like that, well, you don't mind talking to me here? Oh, not at all, Mr. Pym. Lovely day. A lovely garden. A lovely reach of the river. Ah, it's pleasant to be out of doors for once. Well, <laughs> sit down, and do sit down. Make yourselves comfortable. Thank you. Thanks. See, it's just that I'd rather we kept this private. I don't want to upset my wife. You know how these things are. Oh, quite so, sir. It won't take long, I promise you. Uh, now I wondered if you'd be prepared to tell me why you and Miss Wilderspin broke off your relationship. Well, it's hard to give any one reason, you know. Yes. It had been very intense. Mm. But, um, too hot not to cool down. Mm. And I think that... Uh, Eva was becoming rather too possessive. Finally, we both agreed it was pointless going on, and when Eva inherited her mother's house, she decided to make a clean break from me and London. Did you keep up with one another at all? Right. Talk on the phone. Visit. We agreed on a clean break. Yes, I, I suppose you must have had some idea of how Miss Wilderspin made her money, how she managed to maintain what I believe was a high standard of living. Well, of course. Uh, there was a useful annuity from her parents, uh -huh. which I think Greg told me was increased on their deaths. And then there was her work. A textile design consultant? Yes. Yeah. She seemed to have an in with several of the big fabric manufacturers. Enough to make her a wealthy woman? Comfortably off, perhaps, but hardly wealthy. And yet there was over £300,000 in her account when she died. Three hundred. All from consultancies. Well, Sergeant Lawler here is waiting for paperwork from the Inland Revenue. Oh. oh, Frank, would you show Mr. Pym the photograph? Yeah, right, sir. 
Thanks. Is this Eva? I suppose it could be, but she looks very different. Perhaps it's the hairstyle. She looks thinner and much younger than when I remember her. Yeah, thanks very much, sir. Well, that was short and sweet. You're sure you won't have a drink before you go? Gin and platonic or whiskey and sofa? your sister. Oh, where'd you get it? Is it your sister? Oh, sir? yes. Yes, that's Eva. Taken out of a long time ago, but that's Eva. Blow-up of a passport photo taken in 1971. Well, then, there you are. It is the woman who wasn't the woman I refused to believe was my sister. To be frank. Yes? Of the people who knew that lady in London in the 70s, none could be absolutely sure that that was the Eva Wilderstim they knew. But there is some doubt, there is some ambiguity about this whole business of her identification. Let's say we are spreading the net wide. <sighs> Not before time. And to that end, I'd like you to recall, as fully as possible, the nature of the quarrel that led to this complete breakdown of communication between you and your sister for so long. Is it relevant? I find it difficult to believe that a brother and sister, who by all accounts were getting on so harmoniously in 1979 should suddenly have become so irrevocably estranged. Well, the fault was on my side. We'd often fought before. Anyway, late 78, I was given my, my first big chance to write the score for an expensive feature film. The opportunity. I was paid well, and the work went well. I recorded my score. The director was extremely satisfied. So was I. It was the best thing I'd ever done. And then there was a palace revolution in the studio. New man came in to oversee the final stages of post-production. He saw the fine cut, he heard the music, and he went berserk. He insulted me publicly. Against the director's wishes, he commissioned an entirely new score from an, an American composer. Word got round so fast, I was out. I knew that no one in the feature film world would touch me with a barge pole after that. But I suppose I freaked out. Nervous breakdown. It must have been intolerable. And it was then that... Eva and I had our up and down uh, over something quite trivial. I overreacted, she lost her temper, we both said fairly unforgivable things. Well, I suppose if things had started to go my way, I'd eventually have contacted her and apologised. But Well, things haven't gone particularly well, so uh, I hack for a living. But things were going well for your sister in the country, sir. What surprises me is that she didn't try to bury the hatchet. The older, wiser head, you might say. Hmm. Well, they're very stubborn. Ah. You prepared to tell me something about the present state of your finances, sir? Abominable. I'm about 14,000 overdrawn, and unless I can improve matters soon, the bank's going to tighten the thumbscrews. How long have you been uh, up against her? Oh, it's been a gradual process. People are late paying me, so the overdraft mounts. When the money does come in, you can never quite get level. Have you ever tried to do something creative, keep your mind clear for that job and that intellectual challenge during the bank would foreclose on you at any time? Whereas if in 1979 you'd inherited the family house, rather than your sister, things would have been very different. Well, naturally. That's one of the things we quarreled about at the, at the end, Eva and I. When did this... Uh, spectacular quarrel take place. Uh, in 1979, I've told you, before Eva went to Compton Heritage to live. Do you recall when in 1979? Well, I don't give a diary for personal revelations. Quarrel with Eva May the 9th, hope I never see her again. Was it in the early part of the year, sir? Following your uh, disappointment over this feature film music? Uh, well, yeah, yes, yes, it was. It was the early part. I, I guess February, March, something of that order. Well, once again, is it relevant? You'd be surprised to learn just how relevant. Oh, would I? Well, then tell me. Yes. Before I do so, would you be prepared to show me your bank statements and your cheque counterfoils for this current year, Mr. Wildersmith? Well, I should advise you that you're under no legal obligation to do so. But as you yourself rightly commented a few days ago, a man with a clear conscience has nothing to hide. I am as anxious as you are to see you in the clear. Oh, yes, yes. I'm sure that's what they all said to Dr. Crippen. 
I'm glad to see your sense of humour hasn't deserted you, sir. Well, uh, why should it? I've nothing to hide. Look, I'll fetch you what you need now, but I expect you to examine these things here. Help yourselves to coffee, tea, bovril, whatever the hell sustains you when you can't touch liquor. Meantime, I'm taking a bottle of wine to the studio, and I'd like not to be interrupted until you're absolutely finished with my records. All right? More music for Mr. Pimps. Ah. Uh, yes, you all have spoken to Henry, naturally. How was he? In fine form, sir. Oh, good. Because he's about the only man in the business who'll employ me. You get the feeling he dislikes his piano as much as he dislikes us. <laughs> <laughs> he's clever, Frank. And he's desperate. You can call him in now. And good luck. <laughs> Thanks a bunch to you. <laughs> Sir? Mr. Wilderspin! Oh. Still there, are you? What? You sure you won't have some of this, Clarice? We shan't take up much more of your time, sir. Just one or two little details. Ah, oh, that's how they're always. And everything here for your checkbook for July. Oh, hell, is that missing? Maybe I dropped it into the wrong file. Not to worry, sir. We have your bank statement for July. Nothing odd there when compared with the earlier months, except a cash withdrawal on the 21st July for £1,100. Was there anything wrong in withdrawing £1,100 in cash on the say-so of your bank manager? The withdrawal itself is less interesting than the reason for it, sir. And you normally settle everything by cheque or banker's order. I paid that mo Look, let me tell you. Let me tell you why I paid that money in cash, sir. If you swear to reveal it to no one in the music business, all right? You tell us, sir. And unless it's germane to our investigations, it'll go no farther. Look, Henry Pym has been very good to me. My only serious and regular paymaster. He commissioned a library LP and gave me a generous advance. I finished one side. It's... it's, it's all right. But was there a note in my head for side two? And the deadline was approaching fast. I panicked. I had every reason to panic. So, I got in touch with a colleague a man who can hardly string two notes together on paper, but a man who can come up with a damn good theme. See, all I wanted was a theme, and I could take it from there. Orchestrations were I'm good at. So I paid this guy 1100 in cash to come up with the main theme and two subsidies for my part two, which he did. The name of this useful colleague, sir? <laughs> I don't see what bearing this has. Uh, Lester Hall. A curious man, but not without talent. You'll have his address, of course, sir. Naturally. London, is it? Shepherd's Bush. You can either talk to me here, Mr. Hall, or you can talk to me down the neck. I'm easy. So what's it to be? But is it going to be like fast? That's up to you. I don't want to hang around. Get inside, then. Look, keep that kid quiet, can't you? Right, what do you want, then? You know a man called Wilderspin? Wilderspin? Oh, Greg, yeah, 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 sure I do. Is that a crime? I'm CID fellow, not the inland revenue. I don't care how you get paid, but I'm interested in who paid you and why. Paid me? For what? On or just after the 28th July, you received a cash payment of 1,100 quid. Huh? <laughs> You've got to be joking, From John. Gregory Wilderspin. Jeez, did, did Greg tell you that? Someone told me. In return for work on some musical score. Will you shut that brat up? Belt it! Look, if you'd asked around, you'd know I don't do scores, right? I play tenor and alto sax for gigs and sessions, and that's the bottom line. Greg never paid me no 1,100 quid. Or would I be crashing down in this... Stinking pad. You'll have heard from Mr. Collins by now. The will? Yes. Inheritor of a very substantial mansion. 
and three hundred thousand pounds. And you've come to congratulate me. Enjoy a celebratory glass of champagne, perhaps. You know, Lester Hall denies you ever gave him anything, let alone eleven hundred pounds in cash. Who spoke to him? I did, sir. Yesterday. He flatly denied it. But what possible reason? Is he afraid of the taxman? Your colleague isn't the most savoury of men. Did you know that? Quite a record. Some drug pushing, part time pimp, and in 1971 went down for two years for grievous bodily harm. Well, I knew he was a bit of a chancer, but nothing heavy. Look, I'm going to talk to Lester. I'll, I'll have a truth. Why do you think he lied, sir? If lie he did. Well, tax evasion, presumably. <laughs> he has the habit. Sergeant Lawson saw the marks in his arms. He'd do anything, anything, to keep his supplies coming in, wouldn't he? So why should he draw the line at murder? What, what murder? Who's murder? Why not Eva Wilderspins? Can't you think of anything better to do than to, to, to manufacture crazy theories? Why can't you leave me alone and find out what really happened to my sister? By your own admission, your future's bleak. But you know that in 1979, your sister made her will in your favour. For some time, presumably, after she broke up with Henry Pym. To the best of your knowledge, there's been no other male interest in her life. So, you're still in with a chance... Then comes real pressure from your bank. So you hire Lester Hall, a man with an impressive criminal record, for £1,100 in cash, to take your sister out. Everything you've told us is fantasy, with intent to deceive us. I have no doubt that once you've got your hands on your sister's money, there'll be a lot more cash for Lester Hall. But when Sergeant Lawler came knocking at his door, he did what all recidivists do. Shouted, no, not me. Keep away from me, God. I had nothing to do with it, whatever it might be. And if Lester's clever enough to have got himself a watertight alibi, we could think of ten other men in town who'd do a hit and run. For half eleven hundred in cash. Keep the champagne and ice, Mr. Wilderspin. Could be a long, long time before you celebrate. Am I allowed to answer it? You're a free man, sir. I reckon we're just about there, sir. Oh, do you? Well, we put the arm on Lester Hall. 36 hours without a fix and he'll be singing like a dicky bird for a medically approved shot. And have counsel for the defence screaming that he sang under illegal pressure. Uh, it's all supposition so far, Frank. Theory. Oh, we want this case wrapped up, but let's not get too ambitious. Ah. All we have to do is watch Wilderspin. If he cracks once, we'll break him wide open. All right, well, there's something on its way to me that's going to make you think again, Turnbull. Something it's cost me good money to find when you could have done it on the house. Oh, yes. And what might that be, sir? My sister's records from her regular dentist in Marylebone, dated June 1979. How did you come by them? A private detective, at my expense. And when you compare them with the records that were accepted at the inquest, and they're out of line, then will you start believing me? This is terrific, Gregory. How long will you have to wait for the finding? Tomorrow. No, latest, I should have thought. W will you be in the office? Oh, I expect so. Well, then you'll be the first to know. Stand by for the most sensational scoop of your career. <laughs> My God, I can't tell you how relieved I am. Till that call came from Fiona Sinclair this afternoon, I was absolutely certain they were going to run me in. It's, it's, it's the most devastating feeling in the world. Because you're, you're, you're so alone. But the situation... I mean, sort of thing you dream about when you're a cub reporter. I mean, mystery woman carrying off an impersonation for six years. Then, get herself killed. I think it'll be like peeling an onion. Yes. But what happened to Eva back in 1979? I, I, I've got to face the fact that this imposter murdered her and managed to hide her body. 
successfully all this time. She must have lived with suspense every day of her life. Yeah, but the longer the deception went on, the better her chances were. And I mean, for three hundred thousand pounds and a life of idleness, well, but near criminals who settle for less. Oh, I can't wait for that telephone call. How am I supposed to do my stent of sensible work in the morning? And how am I going to sleep tonight? Except that I know what the outcome's going to be. I have sometimes been known to stay here when I'm working late. Oh. I haven't got a toothbrush with me. Does that matter? <laughs> Let me talk to the landlord. This is Dr. Ewan Probert, sir, a dental pathologist from the Home Office. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Wilderspin? So, what did you find? I compared the records supplied by Dr. Blair Chamberlain, orthodontist of 14 Saxony Place, West 1, with those supplied by the local dentist, uh, uh, Mr. Neil Ambrose of the Compton Heritage Surgery. There is no doubt whatsoever these are records of the teeth of one and the same woman. A woman the coroner's court rightfully acknowledged to be your sister, Miss Eva Wilderspin. Oh, dear God. Should you feel it necessary, you may, of course, call in the opinion of any independent dental authority, but I should stress now, there is no possibility of doubt. So where does that leave me? No better, but no worse than you were yesterday afternoon, before these London records came in, sir. This... This is a nightmare. Well, what happens now? We continue our investigations. Does that mean that I'm free to, to, to go home? Oh, certainly. But if you decide to go anywhere else, I'd be grateful if you'd notify me at once. We shall need to talk to you again, sir. Yes, I imagine you will. Oh, Mr. Wilson. Yes. It would be regarded as a gesture of good faith if you were to hand over your passport. Temporarily, of course while investigations proceed. Have I any option? Of course, sir. Entirely your choice. You can pick it up from my place in tree when the time you have. Have you managed to come to terms with the fact that it was Eva who was killed? Oh, I have to, haven't I? I'd hire a private detective and end up with the most sensational own goal of my life. Oh, if only someone could find Lester. Why did he lie about the cash I gave him? Well, he's frightened of the tax man. Or just generally scared of the police. They probably know a lot more about him than we do. Anyway, Lester has an alibi for the night of the murder. How do you know? I think you need... No, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Take it from the top, Henry, please. Well, those two detectives came to see me again yesterday. Very thorough session. By the time they left, I felt I was guilty of everything in the book. Yes, that's the effect they have. Yes, I realize exactly the kind of hell you must be going through. For example, they want you to know my movements the night of the murder. And I was here on my own all night. I had a big recording session the following day. So I did what I always do before a session. Study the score, hear, work out any last band changes, and sleep upstairs in the flat. No telephone calls, no visitors. That's the point of the exercise. Yes, but you've never been under suspicion, Henry. They were just uh, being thorough. Yes, I know. But all the same, I wish I did have an alibi. These customers make it very, very jittery. Yes, so what about Lester? Oh, yes. Lester. Turnbull told me Lester spent that night looking after an elderly aunt in Basingstoke. An elderly aunt in Basingstoke? They believe it. I know. I've never heard anything more unlikely in my life. But they checked. Well, then, if that's the case, I'm in the clear. I didn't pay Lester to kill either. No. You could have bought the services of some other heavy. These things happen. That's why you need help now. Oh, there's no way out. Well, there has to be. Look. I want... I want to get the best legal advice for you I can. Henry, no, I no, can't. someone has to start taking the weight off your shoulders. Otherwise, you'll end up in a funny farm. Well, I've thought about that. And I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the offer. 
Until quite recently, I, I've, I've been under the impression that an innocent man needs no defence, and if I went to a solicitor, I'd be admitting there was a case to answer. But the way things are going, I'm lucky still to be on the loose. Look, Henry, I, I'm off back home this evening. I, I promise you, I'll think things through, and I'll ring you with my decision. Will you be at home? No, I'll be here. Another all-night wrestle with the scores. But tonight, I'll make an exception and keep the line open. Now, ring me any time, any time at all. If I'm in the flat, there's a bedside telephone. Remember. Kim Fearless. Kim, it's Gregory. I've got to talk to you. What's happened? I'm speaking from home. I'm leaving for Eva's house now. Meet me in the drive there at 11 o'clock. Stay in your car, no lights, and please, for God's sake, wait until I show up. Come round here, to the boot. What? what? What's all this about? You're in for a shock. Brace yourself. Oh, my God. Sit down, Kim. And drink this. What is Oh, yes. Now, please, please concentrate on what I'm going to tell you. You have to remember every word, because before long the police will be here. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, but that... Who is he? Lester Hall. Oh. The man who denied I paid him 1100 to help with the score. When I drove into my garage tonight, there he was, dead. Now, whoever killed him and dumped him there would have tipped off the police anonymously. And if I had just stood by, wringing my hands, and the police had arrived and found me with Lester's body on my property, I'd be inside the nick facing a couple of guys with rubbish and ladies. But why did you bring her here? I mean, they're bound to come here sooner or later. Yes, but when they do, you'll be here. You know about Lester now. They'll have to agree that I wasn't trying to dispose of his body in secret, and you can print the story. Uh, I, I like you, Kim. I like you a lot, and I hate dragging you in on this, but I need help. Uh, I've been thinking... All right. You didn't kill Eva and Lester, but somebody did. Why? Right. It's so simple that I, I, I've done nothing these past few days but try to get myself out of trouble when I should have been looking for whoever caused the trouble in the first place. I, I'm the only person to benefit financially by her death. So, what's the next on the list of motives? Sexual jealousy? Well, as far as we know, Eva's had no kind of love life since she moved here. So what's next? Where did she get all that money from? Yes. Where? Uh, if the police had got their act together, they, they could have found that out by now, but they'd been too busy putting the boot into me. I can't believe any consultancy fees, however large, could have been able to sort away £300,000 after tax. Blackmail? Yes, I'm afraid so. It's something I've tried not to think about, but now I'm having to. I never liked Eva, I'm afraid, but I respected her. I thought she was highly principled. But if it's true, if you're right... We... Who could afford to pay her that kind of money? And what kind of hold did she have over them? Well, that's why I came here tonight. The answer has to be here, somewhere in this house. Some evidence she could use if the victim refused to pay on the nail. And we have to find it before the police arrive, because once they've seen Lester in my car, they'll have to arrest me. But what are we looking for? I don't know. All we can do is look. What time is it? Almost five. I hate drawn curtains. Oh, Greg. We've been searching for hours. Nothing. And ghastly through the drizzling dawn on the bald street breaks the blank day. What? This is quite simply the worst moment of my life. We have to find something. There's a dead man in my car. That's all I can think about. Who is doing this to me? 
What's that? Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday. Look, Kim, this is the crunch. Now, here's a set of keys to the house. Will you promise to go on looking? Because Turnbull won't look further than me once he's seen Lester. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, it's so absolutely horrible. I love you. I love you. Right. Let's go and meet them halfway. Wilderspin! What the devil have you been playing at? You put in a call, sir, to the train police station saying you'd been burgled. When the police arrived, the house was in darkness. The locals affected an entrance found nothing untoward except that you weren't there. Who's this? Uh, Kim Fairless. I'm a reporter for the Western Chronicle. But what's a reporter doing here at this time of the morning? Tell him, Kim. You'd better look in the boot of Mr. Wilderspin's car. The one ahead of yours. <sighs> Frank... Why did you make that call to the police? I made no call. But I knew somebody would. Wait. Why? Good God! It's Lester Hall, and he's been strangled. I'm answering no questions and making no statement until I have a solicitor with me. That's your right. Call him. I haven't got one. Oh, for God's sake! But I have the offer of one through Henry Pym. Then call him and make it fast. You got his number? Yes. And get on with it. Know the other phone. Uh, well, I saw him yesterday. He said I should have legal advice. How right he was. That's ringing now. Probably ring a long time. It's guess it's six in the morning. The man will be sleeping like a log. No, no, no. It's the studio I'm ringing. He said he'd take a call from me at any time at all. Oh, hey, Henry. It's Gregory. Yeah, 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 yes, Henry, Henry. Henry, will you just listen a minute? I'm under arrest for the murder of Lester Hall. Yeah, yes, 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 Lester. And I need that solicitor urgently. I'm afraid the case against your friend is a very strong one, Henry. And he's been his own worst enemy. Everything he's tried to do to clear himself is simply backlash. Yes. I hate to ask you this, but having been there throughout his interrogation and having vetted his final statement, do you believe he's innocent? Oddly enough, yes. Oh, thank God. The mind that controlled the whole affair, the suborning of Lester Hall to kill Eva, the eventual murder of Lester Hall, whose nerves were obviously cracking, would never have blundered around as Greg Wilderspin's done... He's just a highly sensitive man who panicked, as most innocent people would panic, in a situation that was and is becoming increasingly ugly. He's going to need the best counsel you can afford. And in the end, I'm very much afraid it'll be a great deal of money spent to no effect. Oh, money doesn't matter. Freeing Greg does. What about that absurd alibi of Lester's? That business of the elderly aunt in Basingstoke. Elderly, yes. But she has all her faculties, she doesn't like the police, and she has no form. If she lied, well, she lied in the first place to protect Lester. And now she's lying again to protect his reputation, and I suppose by association her own. Now, who would want to be known as the elderly aunt of a middle-aged murderer? Yet, Basingstoke's well on the way to Dorset. And Compton Heritage. Yes. Well, do your best for Greg. Instruct the best counsel. I don't care what it costs, because I'm certain Greg's been framed. And I want him off the hook. Preferably before the New Year's Honours list's drawn up. Yes? Sir? What is it, Frank? Well, it's Kim Fairless here, that reporter. Hmm? She says it's urgent, and she'll talk to nobody but you. What about well, the Wilderspin case. Vital, she said. Oh, vital. Urgent. Reporters always think in headlines, don't they? If she's wasting my time, I'll... No, all right, sure. Call in, miss. May I speak to a loan chief, Inspector? Why? Well, you'll understand when I tell you. Oh, will I, indeed? All right, Frank, off you go. Sir... It'd better be good, Miss Ferris. Gregory Wilderspin. 
and you, I imagine, wondered how Eva managed to amass so much money while she was living in Compton Heritage. He thought, reluctantly, blackmail. That had occurred to us. We've done our homework, Miss Fairless. The money came in clean from various businesses connected with the textile industry. Checks, not cash, Mum. I think you'll want to take a closer look at the names behind the names of those businesses in a moment, Mr. Turnbull. Oh, yes? Why? Well, let me ask you this. If an adult male has sex with very underage girls, is that a criminal offence? You know damn well it is. Why? Well, if he has himself photographed while he indulges, is that serious? It's serious, and it's sick. What's all this about? If Eva Wilderspin somehow came into possession of an album of such photographs, wouldn't that be an excellent foundation for blackmail, particularly if the man in question was wealthy and widely known? Just tell me. You know that Gregory gave me the keys to Eva's house? Yes. The difference between you and me is that I've always known he was innocent. I went on searching, and today, in the summer house beneath a carefully rigged floorboard, I found a locked steel box. I took it back to the office and had it forced open. It contained the album of photographs I've been talking about. I don't recognize the man concerned, but I'm very sure I know who he is, and you will too. Let me see it. Good grief. Horrifying, aren't they? You'll need the album, but uh, I've personally and privately taken copies of every photograph. If you don't act on them, I will. You'll agree, Mr. Pym, that the central character in these sexual activities is you. Yes. That Eva Wilderspin, during the time when she was your mistress, somehow discovered this album. And apart from her first feeling of repugnance, which ended your relationship, she used it to blackmail you. And that you laundered the payoff money through various textile firms via the old boys' network. Yes. But I stopped that kind of thing once Eva told me she'd found the album. Look, Chief Inspector, which is worse? A sexual aberration or a blackmailer? I detest both. I'd guess that Vesta Hall, having once been a pimp, knew the scene. He procured these children and took the pictures, didn't he? And when Eva Wilderspin's financial demands became too grandiose, you paid Lester Hall cash to kill her. And it had to be done soon. It isn't true, I swear. It isn't true. It's open knowledge you're in for a knighthood or even a peerage in the next honours list. For services to charity. Then Hall decided to put the bite on you himself. And so you killed him and dumped him on Greg Wilderspin. The obvious suspect in the affair. Did you know that one of your cars, a Toyota, was seen leaving the village of Treme at high speed shortly before a telephone call was made to the Treme police that Wilderspin's house had been burned? Oh, I went to Treme because I'd received a telephone call from Lester saying he was at Gregory's and he had to see me on a matter of urgency in connection with Greg's predicament. And so for that, you drove to Treme all that way from an important night in the studio studying scores. Scores were less important than Greg's liberty. Why did you choose the inconspicuous Toyota when you had a Rolls to drive? Because the Rolls wouldn't start. It's true! You've caused a lot of pain, embarrassment and trouble. But that's nothing to the pain, embarrassment and trouble ahead of you now. Sir Lola. Sir? Advise this citizen of his rights. Then book him. your wife. Oh, Jenny. Can we talk alone? No. I've come to see you because I need to speak to you face to face. <clears throat> I shan't talk to you again, ever. Oh, Jenny, you can't believe I'm a killer. You can't. Jenny, you know me. I thought I did, till I heard about those photographs. That was the worst of all in some ways. I've done my crying, Henry. The children are abroad with my parents. When the trial's over, I shall get a divorce. I'll change my name, and I'll do everything to see the children forget you were ever their father. Oh, <coughs> I've lost everything I ever worked for. If I lose you and the kids, what's the point of going on? To pay the price. Would you have wanted to have children by... a child molester? 
If I had a gun, I'd shoot you myself for what you've done to us. Look, it's getting a bit noisy in here. Why don't we go back to the Grange and we can celebrate in peace? I'm sorry, Kim, but I, I'm not up to public conviviality, not tonight. Yes, Henry betrayed me, he betrayed his wife, and Eva, and Lester, and he deserves his life sentence, but... Well, I, I still remember that he gave me my first and best musical chances. Oh, come on. Not just yet. What? Why not? Or would you rather we went to your place? I want to stay here. For a while, at least. But why? What's the attraction? We'd be far better off on our own. I don't know that it's safe to be alone with you. Safe? Kim? Look round carefully now at that man on his own at the bar, brooding over his pint. A pale-faced guy with a cap and glasses? Yes, you know him? Well, of course I don't know him. Is he a regular? His name's Stanley Bishop. Oh. Does it make him interesting? Until about three months before Eva was killed, he was her part-time gardener up at the Grange. Then he had a heart attack, was in the infirmary for quite a time, and convalesced with his sister in Truro. And he's on the men now. Oh, good. Well. He came back to his cottage a week ago, back to Compton Heritage. I didn't get a chance to talk to him till earlier this evening. I persuaded him to come across here because I knew you'd arranged to meet me in the pub. Stanley Bishop knows you used to visit Eva occasionally at the Grange. Oh, that's absurd. No, he remembers hearing you play the piano sometimes after a meal. He enjoyed that, he said, as he deadheaded the flowers. He never saw me. No, at the piano, Greg. You did visit Eva occasionally. Yes. So why have you lied all along? Because by the terms of the will drawn up by my parents, I knew I'd inherit everything if Eva was childless when she died. So you were at the Grange. There was a meeting ah. with Eva. That entry was accurate in her engagement diary. I went to ask her for a loan, and she refused. We had a hell of a row. I stormed off, and later I realized that it was perfectly possible that no one had ever known I was there, apart from Eva. Later? You mean when the police rang with the news of the incident with the car? Yes. All the way there, that bloody dreadful journey in the night and rain, I kept thinking, I have no satisfactory alibi for the night. I'm in a hopeless financial mess. Eva wouldn't give me money, and I'm her sole legatee. What better reason for killing her than that? So you came up with this imposter theory to cloud the direct issue, as Turnbull always suspected. Yes, but it gave me public interest and sympathy. It caught you on my side. You fooled me, yes. So, why did you hire that obviously efficient private detective to hunt down Eva's dental records? I mean, you must have known what they'd reveal. To, uh, to improve the police's awareness of my obsession with an imposter. Would I go to that length to prove myself a liar or a fool? It didn't work in the end, did it? They arrested you. And it would have been you in the dock at the Old Bailey if I hadn't found that album of photographs that implicated Henry Pym. Yes, but you did. If I hadn't, you'd have quite suddenly remembered where Eva's secret hiding place was. You were children together in that house, weren't you? Weren't you? The day in the diary, August the 5th, I arrived at the Grange early, by chance rather than design. Eva was out somewhere having lunch, as it later turned out. It was a, it was a beautiful day, and I potted around the garden. Eventually, I went to the summer house. And, yes, remembering our childhood hideaway, I examined it from sentimental curiosity. And uh, I found Henry's delightful little hardcore album. Did you tax Eva with it when she came home? No. Why not? Well, because it, because it, it made me ashamed. Ashamed because although I never liked Eva, I had always respected her. And because although I never really respected Henry, I was fond of him. Can you understand that? I guess that Eva must have found it at Henry's. And that she'd taken it away when she split with Henry on account of it. And to that extent, I was right. Are you telling me you never suspected blackmail? No. Would you? Would you think of your sister as being a blackmailer? No, I thought she'd, I thought she'd kept it to remind us of the man she might quite easily have married. It wasn't until Turnbull told me how much Eva had in her private account that I realised that you should put that album too. Yes, you didn't tell the police. No. 
because by then I was already too deep in my own mind. If I revealed my knowledge of that source of blackmail, they'd assume that Henry, Lester, and I were all in a conspiracy together. Oh, you could have been. Oh, do you imagine Henry would have kept quiet if I'd been involved in any way? Why do you think he persuaded Lester to lie about the 1100 in cash I gave him, except to incriminate me further? That 1100. Probably the only thing you didn't lie about in the whole affair. Otherwise, everything you've said and done was with intent to deceive. Unforgivable. Oh, you got the story of the year out of it. Oh. You're getting a colossal advance to write a book about it. There's talk of film rights. It's the best thing that ever happened to you. And you say it's unforgivable. Or is it that you believe that I duped you emotionally? That is exactly what you did. I began by needing to have you on my side. I ended by needing you for your own sake. Touching. But unconvincing. Well, all right, if you don't believe me, let's call it quits. Look, I'm tired to the bottom of my soul, and I want to rest. I'm going home. If you don't come with me, we're through. Greg, do you love me? Do you need to ask? In Intent to Deceive by Michael Robson, Gregory was played by Nigel Anthony, Kim by Zila Clark, and Inspector Turnbull by Steve Hodson. Henry Pym, Anthony Jackson, Eva, June Barry, Dr. Napier, John Evaneri, Sergeant Lawler, Jonathan Nibbs, P.C. Newton, Stephen Tompkinson, Arthur, Paul Sir, The Coroner, Lawrence Payne, Fiona, Sandra Clark, Collinge, Paul Nicholson, Faith, Angela Barlow, Lester, Simon Cuff, Dr. Probert, John Baddeley, Eastbrook, John Sampson, and Jenny, Lynn Sagofsky. The pianist was John Bishop. Intent to Deceive was directed in Bristol by Sean McLaughlin. There's more drama when the six times married classical actor and theatre impresario Sir Merlin Foster commissions Charlie Nicholson to write a play for him. This comes as a surprise, as Charlie has a creative block following a disastrous first play and incurring gambling debts for which he's being actively pursued. Sounds like a difficult task, as Donald Sindon stars in The Final Twist at this time next week. When Gregor Samsa woke one morning from uneasy dreams, he found himself transformed in his bed into a monstrous insect. Benedict Cumberbatch reads a classic of 20th century literature. He was lying on his hard shell-like back, and when he lifted his head a little, he could see his dome-shaped brown body, banded with reinforcing arches, on top of which the blanket maintained its precarious hold. A dark tale of change, isolation, and identity. His numerous legs, pitifully thin in relation to the rest of his bulk, danced ineffectually before his eyes. Marking the 100th anniversary of Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, this Monday to Thursday evening at 6, here on BBC Radio 4 Extra. What has happened to me, he thought. It was not a dream. Now, here on 4 Extra, we've been speaking to a host of comedians about the rituals and worries that they go through before taking to the stage. Warming up the backstage habits and rituals of comedians. Hello, my name is Tony Law, and before a gig, I like to have a costume to change into, usually when I'm doing uh, tours or Edinburgh or things like that. And I like to pace a lot, and I like to wander off and make people worried that I'm not going to arrive. And when I'm doing gigs where I don't have a chance to change into a outfit, I like to arrive really, really late, and because I, I really enjoy the stress of people texting, say, "Where are you? How far are you away?" And even though I'm only five minutes away, sometimes I stand outside. Uh, I know it makes me um, probably a jerk, but I'm always there always make it but I, I think it's just distraction 
I like to be distracted. So pacing, wandering, being late, and changing into clothes. So I love I love doing a tour show where you've got a mirror and you're just all on your own. And you can just look at yourself the whole time and, you know, just pretend that you don't look awful. And just, oh, I, I do. I genuinely like that. Oh, cigarette. I have one cigarette exactly five minutes before the show. Put it out at two minutes too. Downstairs. You ready to go on? Boom. The digital station for comedy, drama, and entertainment. BBC Radio 4 Extra. Not a lot to report, sir, and most of it negative. Mm. Her movement yesterday. Well, the cleaning lady was there all morning, and Miss Wilderspin didn't leave the place during that time. Yeah. Did she have any visitors, morning or afternoon? From the time when Mrs. Benison, cleaning lady, mm. left the house at about half twelve until about eight in the evening, when Miss Wilderspin arrived at the Lamb and Flag, the record's blank. Mm. So she went to the pub. Was this a, a one-off visit, or was she a regular? Well... Apparently, she went there for dinner on Wednesday and Saturday evenings. Last night, she had a couple of drinks at the bar, chatted to a few customers, then went to the dining area for a meal. On her own? Yes, sir. She was usually on her own, but sometimes there were a few people with her. Mostly Londoners, the landlord thinks. Any one person in particular? Not that the landlord or the barmaid recollected, sir, no. Yeah. What did they say when you asked if her brother was ever with her? Well, they didn't remember that she ever mentioned a brother. Oh. Well, all I want to know is this. Was he telling the truth about never visiting Eva here? And damn it all, it had been his childhood home. All right, Frank, go on. Eva went to the dining area for her meal, on her own. She had half a bottle of wine with her supper and read a book throughout the meal. A book? No book was found anywhere near the scene of the incident. No, sir. They used to keep it under the counter for her. They showed me it. Huge, great biography. So she'd just read it at the pub and on her own. <sighs> Did anyone go over and, and uh, talk to her at any time during the supper? Well, the staff don't think so, sir. So what time did she leave the pub? Just before closing time, around 10.30. Mm. Did she usually walk to and from the pub? Yes, sir. It's less than half a mile from there to her house, and unless it was foul weather, she was inclined to walk. So anyone could have discovered her pattern of behaviour? Looks like that, sir. Mm. So it wasn't raining when she left. I, otherwise, she'd have bummed a lift home from one of the regulars. That's right. Must have started raining when she was oh, roughly halfway home, mm. not long before she was hit. You got a list of the names of all the people in the pub last night? Everyone the landlord and the barmaid recognised, sir. Mm. Any strangers? Uh, Middle-aged couple, sir. Quiet, friendly. Geordie's they sounded like, the landlord thought. And what time did they leave? About eight, after a bar snack. No. Well, tomorrow we'll talk to the regulars. Well, what did they make of her, the, the, the staff of the pub? Well, it seems that those who knew her liked her well enough, but no one knew her well. They talk of a regular man in her life. Yeah, no talk from that quarter, sir. No. Oh, I had your message about the Land Rover. Came out a bit garbled. <laughs> Sorry about that, Duke. Yeah. Well, Arthur Graham was driven to and from the Stapleton Arms by Lambert and Scase. Pleasant enough, lads, no form. Yeah. They left the pub at kicking out time and drove Arthur straight home, in the opposite direction to the one taken by Miss Wilderspin. They saw him into the house, and according to his girlfriend, he was so smashed that he fell asleep without taking his shoes off. Yeah. This girl, is she reliable? Yeah, too reliable for the likes of Arthur. So when did he last use the Land Rover? Yesterday afternoon, sir. Delivered a load of split logs to Enderby Farm and got home about six. And left the keys in the ignition? Oh, he says not. Yeah. But he couldn't find them this morning. And he's never had a spare set since he bought the vehicle. So he could be joyriders? Could be, sir. Boring. But we've got to get them, and get them fast. A woman's dead, and I want the driver responsible inside a Crown Court as quick as you like. Henry Pym. Henry, it, it's Gregory Wilderspin. Greg, how are you, my old love? 
How's every little thing? And how's the music? Yeah, things are terrible. I, I'm speaking from Eva's house. The police say... ...there was hidden by the medical cap. Well, that could make quite a difference. Look, she's not my sister. What colour's your sister's hair? Dark brown, like mine. So is that lady? Look, Inspector, I can see the whole of her face from her forehead to her chin, and I can assure you she is not my sister. Hmm. When did you last see your Miss Wilderspin? About six years ago. Six years? When you're only 80-odd miles apart? Yes, well, we had a serious disagreement before she left London to live here. We haven't been in touch since. I see. But people don't change radically in six years. That, that, that person looks... Quite like my sister, but they're trying the same thing. I mean, I mean, people say I look quite like Ronald Coleman. But Who's I mean... Ronald Coleman, sir? Oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I can see you don't believe a word I've said. <laughs> I simply don't understand how your statement squares with the fact that the handbag she was carrying at the time of the incident contained items personal to Miss Eva Wilderspin. Oh, perhaps it was stolen. I mean, that's, that's something you're going to have to discover, isn't it? Look... My sister's lived in Compton Heritage for six years. Plenty of people in the village must know her. Find them. Get them over here. Let them see her. I'm, I'm as concerned about the condition of that poor woman in there as you are, but I'm more concerned about my sister. Where is she? All right, Frank, you've read the report. What do you think? Well, <sighs> it all starts with that call, sir, doesn't it? The fellow who rang emergency to report finding the woman. The fellow who wasn't there when our people arrived. So? Well, it seems to me we can probably have seen one of two things. First, the caller hit the woman with his car by accident, night and rain, panicked and drove on. Then he pulled himself together and at least made that call from the kiosk and hoped the ambulance would get her to the hospital before it was too late. Mm. And the second? Well, the caller wasn't involved with the incident at all. Just a guy with a skin full of booze on his way home. Sees the woman lying there, takes a closer look, then beetles off to the nearest public telephone, makes the call... Then, because he's way over the legal limit, gets off home fast. And what about the brother? What's he up to? Ah, really weird, that is. I mean, why would he invent a situation like that when he knows if the woman survives, she can tell us the facts? Hmm. Let's look at it charitably, for the moment. Or could it be this? He's feeling guilty that he hasn't been in touch with her for six years. And when he knows she's critically injured, mightn't pull through, before they have a chance to make up this quarrel of theirs, he tries to fool himself it's not his sister at all. Well, he was shattered, wasn't he? Mm. Well, he's the best actor I've ever seen. But he's obviously an intelligent man. I reckon when he's had time to calm down and think things out, he'll agree she is his sister. Yeah. Well, for her sake, for, for all our sakes, I to God she survives. <laughs> Yes. Yes, Newton, what is it? A uh, farmer in Mulbrook's reported a Land Rover abandoned in a narrow track leading to one of his pastures, sir. Can't get his cattle past. Have you got all the details? Yes, sir. We've traced ownership to a Mr. Arthur Graham of <laughs> Maindem Cottage Beauty. <laughs> Graham. Graham. Oh. Well, you know him, sir. Oh, yes. You know him well, don't we, Frank? <laughs> right, young tear away. You, Frank, you get over to Graham's place now and lean on him. If he tries his jack, then I'd act. Bring him in. I'll take it. Yes? Yeah, all right, put it on. Good morning, ma'am. I see. But I'll be over right away. <sighs> the victim, whoever she was, died ten minutes ago. Uh, without having recovered consciousness at any time. Oh. Frank, before you talk to Graham... Send Frost and Davril around the whole of Compton Heritage. They've got to find at least three responsible people who knew Miss Wilderspin well. Uh, Neighbours, domestic help, shopkeepers, the vicar. We have got to have positive identification for the coroner. Mr. Wilderspin. Yes? I'm sorry about the news, sir. Well, so am I. But she wasn't my sister. Yes. Naturally, sir, I am taking what you say very seriously. And for that reason, I'd like you to come with me to your sister's home. There's a chance we may find something that'll be helpful to both of us there. I know my sister's home very well. But you told me you hadn't seen her since she moved here, sir. Yes, but she inherited my parents' house. and I, I spent the first 18 years of my life there. Hello, Arthur. Oh, it's you. Come about my motor, have you? 
What's the story there? Have you found it? Ah. Somehow you lost your motor, did you? Damn sure I lost him. One in the yard this morning weren't there. I rang into the station right quick. Now, where's he to? Oh, you rang in. That's good. <laughs> you mean good? Some bugger stole my motor and I had to walk to work. What happened last night? What happened? Someone stole my motor. What were you doing last night? <sighs> Where are my two most nights? Stapleton Arms. How'd you get there? Guy Lambert and Toby Scase picked me up and bring me home. How long were you at the pub? Well, don't know exactly. This ain't finding my motor, is there? How long? <sighs> Got there about eight. Left at finishing time. Why? Finishing time? 10.40? Oh, on the nail, Sergeant. And Lambert drove you home? Yes. Asked him. When you got home, was your Land Rover in the yard? How the hell would I know? Went straight to bed, didn't I? Wonderful views from here. Yes. It was always my favourite room. What'll happen to the house? Supposing it was your sister who died. My parents believed in primogeniture, Inspector. Of a particular sort. They'd leave the house and grounds in their entirety to their first child, whatever its sex. So when they died, Eva inherited the place. If she had children, it would be entailed to her first child. If she died childless and I survived, it would come to me. Mm. But she's not dead. Anyway, that woman in the hospital isn't her, so... Lord knows what'll happen. Mind if I smoke, sir? Yeah, go ahead. A pipe? Feel free. Thank you, sir. It's not everyone who's prepared to put up with pipe smoke. My daughter gives me hell. Really? You'd recognise your sister's handwriting. Oh, naturally. After a gap of six years. <laughs> Inspector, uh, when she was about 15, Eva decided to learn and use chancery script. It was all the vogue then, special nibs, black ink, white paper. She's used it ever since. I see. Because this is her address book. Yes? Is that her handwriting? It, it could be. I so. Well, the, the whole point about chancery script is that anyone can write it, if they have the patience to learn the technique, and, and, and everyone's hand looks much the same. Mm. I found no address or telephone number for a doctor, but there is one for a dentist, in Fawnsett St. Nicholas. So? Now, if your sister was a patient of his, he'd have complete dental records, sir, which we can compare with the teeth of the... The lady who died this morning. If they tally, will you accept that it was your sister who died? It, she was killed in a hit-and-run accident. Eva. Yes, but I, I, I know the dead woman is not Eva. Hang up, bad Greg. Is that you? Yes, if I didn't ever know my own sister. What do you mean? Look, Henry, this, this, this whole thing's played havoc with my work schedule, and, and the score isn't finished. Tomorrow there's the inquest on, on, on this dead lady, and I've got to be there. And I'll tell the court the truth. Then the press are going to be after me, so I need a bolt hole. I need to finish the score in private, so can I use the studio? The court is very aware of your distress and your anxiety, Mr. Wilderspin. But you've heard all the corroborative evidence from the village postmistress, from the rector from the landlord of the local inn, all of whom saw your sister, if not daily, then at least once or twice a week, for six years. They saw the unfortunate victim of this appalling incident and independently identified her as Miss Eva Wilderspin of Challoners Grange. Dental records confirmed this. Do you still persist in maintaining that the dead woman was not your sister? I don't doubt that the woman who was killed had lived in this village for six years as my sister, looking quite like her, and using a good enough reproduction of her handwriting. What I am maintaining is that this woman must have assumed my sister's identity before she ever came to live here, for, for reasons I can't begin to understand. Now, 
coming. Oh. Hello, Mr. Wilderspin. My name's Kim Fairless. I was in court today. Oh, yeah? I'm a reporter from the Western Chronicle. May I talk to you? Well, I'm leaving in ten minutes. Oh, that'll do. Oh, you better come in. I've looked for earlier photographs of her here. None. And I know there aren't any at my home. I've never kept any letters or postcards from her. Why would I? How long did she live in London before she moved out here? Oh, about four years, I suppose. Have you still got her old address? Address? Oh, she had several. Chelsea, Pimlico, Marylebone. No, I haven't. She was eight years older than I am, and we had nothing in common beyond our parentage. Our last meeting ended in an unholy row, and well, we severed communications completely. So you and she never met again, or spoke on the telephone? No, not a word, not a line in six years. Mm. But you don't forget what your own sister looks like, for God's sake. Would you? But why would another woman want to assume your sister's identity? <sighs> well, my notion, and, and I admit it, it, it sounds like the plot of a B-movie, is, is this. The woman met Eva, probably at some party in London. Perhaps someone remarked they were lookalikes. This woman cultivated Eva, got to know her lifestyle. She's in some deep trouble, wants to disappear. So when she knows Eva's inherited this place and an increased annuity and that Eva and I are never likely to meet again, she disposes of Eva. Starts a new life and the new identity here as Eva Wilderspin. Well, it sounds lame, it sounds absurd. What, what other explanation could there be? But this was your parents' house, and you and Eva once lived here. I mean, surely someone in the village would spot the difference. No, my sister went her own way from home when she was 18 or 19. Apart from a very occasional visit, she'd never spent any time here or in the village. You're just leaving. Where can I reach you if I find anything useful? No, I'd rather get in touch with you. Look, no offence, but... I'm wildly behind on some work, and uh, I promised my paymaster I'd get stuck into it immediately after the inquest. What kind of work? Uh, I'm a hack composer. I write library music. What on earth is that? <laughs> well, if radio, uh, television, film companies can't afford to commission original music, and they don't want to pay for... Now it's time for some drama here on 4 Extra, which was first broadcast in 1989. Intent to Deceive is centred on the facts around the death of Eva Wilderspin, killed by a hit-and-run driver. But the question is, why is her brother Gregory under suspicion? Look, the bank manager was polite, but tough. Unless he sees proof of a considerable upturn in my finances, he's going to call in the mortgage and the loan. What does that mean, exactly? Well, it means I have to sell the house. By the time the bank's taken its dues, I'll be left with only about 6,000 to start all over again. Oh, Greg, you were always a muddler. You yes, and you were always the lucky one. You've got a very generous annuity. Generous? I'll cover the mortgage and overdraft repayments and the life insurance premiums. Then, for heaven's sake, sell that rambling place of yours. And rent rooms until you've got yourself out of this mess. I don't know how you manage to work at all with these perpetual money worries. All I need is something to tide me over. For three months, that's all. Then I'm pretty sure I'll get another commission from Henry Pym. Wouldn't you do better going back to teaching? Then at least you'd have a regular income. Oh, let's not open that can of beans, Eva, please. All right, all right. Something to tide you over. How much? Twelve thousand. Intent to Deceive by Michael Robson with Nigel Anthony, Zila Clark and Steve Hodson. Then, uh, accident. Oh my! G oh God! Y yes, yes, yes. Of course, you have my consent. You're, you're the people who know what's required. Yes. 
Yes, I'll come at once. Mr. Wilderson. Yes? Detective Chief Inspector Turnbull, sir. Detective? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was simply told there'd been an accident. What, what happened? A call was made to the local station at five past two this morning. The caller, a man who wouldn't give his name, said there was a badly injured woman lying by the side of the lane, close to Belgrove Crossroads. What hit and run? On the face of it. Has my sister been able to describe what happened? She was unconscious when she was found, and she's been unconscious ever since. Then how did you manage to discover that I'm her next of kin? The lady's identity and address were obtained from the contents of her handbag, sir. I then went to her home and looked for her personal address book. The only will to spin in it was you. Thank God my number was in there. I'm her only relative. I'm afraid we need you to identify her at once, sir. And the medical people will require you to sign the appropriate forms of authority for the surgery they've had to carry out on your verbal agreement only. There were a few minor facial lacerations, Mr. Wilderspin, but fortunately her head wasn't struck by the vehicle. The cuts appear to have been caused when your sister was thrown into the ditch by the side of the lane. Her features aren't disfigured. But it can't be possible. <laughs> Doctor, this lady is not my sister. Of course, the uh, lady's...